for those who don't know in the recording, my name's Ali Ansel. This is Kareen Lawrence. We're the co-founders of this whole shindig, values-based living. And uh, we do a bunch of things, including uh, courses, both, both live and virtual. We do circles every month. Um, we have a podcast. We do a bu bunch of fun stuff. And um, hi, Lola. That's the, <laughs> the mascot dog. And uh, this is another cool thing that we get to do. So thanks for joining. I just want to acknowledge that I am on Treaty 8 territory today traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. And specifically, some of the communities that are in this area are the Katunaha, the Silix, and the Sinix people. And there are also other Métis and ind Indigenous peoples in the land where I am, which is an area of BC, by the way. And Kareen, what do you want to say about where you are today? I'm dialing in from Calgary or Mokinstis, which is located on the ancestral lands of the people of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, and that's the Siksika, Bagani, Kainai First Nations. Uh, Treaty 7 also includes the Satana First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, that is the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. Uh, and it's also the traditional land used by the Métis people, which includes the Métis Region 3 of Southern Alberta. Um, and I think we want to uh, honor the traditional teachings uh, values that um, are part of the, the history of values that we need to honor and acknowledge that's been going on before we, we started our learnings and teachings. Mm -hmm. So, so, so grateful. Absolutely. Thanks, Kareem. Today, what we're going to do is it's going to be a Q&A session. For people who have, we're really focusing on people who have taken the online version of our courses. Um, we wanted to come up with ways to be directly uh, interacting with people who are taking things virtually, who want to be able to talk through things or ask specific questions to us without having to use something like a chat function. It's a lot more engaging. So we're going to have that opportunity. We're also going to go over um, some content, which is the top five challenges that we're noticing that people face when they're getting to know their values. Uh, and we're going to um, start with just a high level overview of that to give you a sense of what's coming. And then just check to see if anybody has any burning questions, because that's really the priority today is to answer as many questions as we can. And then we'll share within our hour as much of the top five challenges that we can. And also, it's really great to hear from people who've done the values work, what challenges they've faced. So it'd be great to hear from people, too. Uh, if you're here, if you're experiencing something in getting to know your values that you're not hearing us say, uh, mention that because other people will probably resonate with it, too. So it was fun to come up with the top five challenges that we see people face around knowing your values because we're literally hearing it from people in our live sessions. And there are definitely themes. So I'm just going to hit on them and then we'll see if there's any questions um, uh, around values in general or around any of these things. So the top five challenges when getting to know your values. Number one, connecting to emotions. We're going to go into that a little bit and we're going to, for each of these, go into a couple of ways that you can address this. If you're noticing this is your challenge too. connecting to emotions. Number one, number two perfectionism. Number three, self-trust, learning to trust ourselves. Number four, community. And there's a metaphor I go to again and again about um, healthy fish in a poison river, which I'm going <laughs> to probably nerd out about again. And then the fifth one is instant gratification. And this thing that we are all probably becoming closer and closer with over time, which is um, this need to have an instant reward for an action or an attempt or a, a try of some kind. So we're gonna go into each of those, but first any like burning questions or wonderings about either what has come up in a course that you may have taken or in um, just your relationship with your values in general. And Gavin, you're our practice guy. Anything coming up for you? Uh, as soon as I got this, I kind of had uh, 
mind starts racing because you ask questions in different ways than what I think about it myself, which is why this is so good for me. Uh, I think it might be tied into your instant gratification there, but I found it's kind of like uh, you can get so far in life by following the rules of society, but you kind of hit a brick wall. And in order to take this step, you have to let yourself become quite untethered and it's very unnerving because in some ways, in some ways you're leaving behind the comfort of right and wrong. It's not that there isn't right or wrong or good or evil, but, but slapping a simplified label on things uh, doesn't work anymore. And that's just kind of, I think that's the toughest part for me is that you can get so far following the rules and then you hit a brick wall and then you hit this stuff and you can't apply the same skills you've learned to get this far. You can't improve on the same skills that you've that's have gotten you this far. It's completely different skills to take that step. So I was kind of interested in all of the stuff you have to say on this. Well, if that's deep, man. Yeah. And that's a big one. And I think that's a big reason why people will choose or unconsciously choose not to bother. Hey, they bump up against that wall of like, oh, okay, I've gone as far as I can go. Either I can learn a whole new way of being, or I could just stop. (laughs) And I think a lot of us get tempted to just stop because it's a lot of work otherwise. Well, it's also, no one sets you up for the expectations of it. Like Brene Brown talks about being vulnerable and that's a skill you need to have, but be vulnerable for what? Because, you know, when you're vulnerable, it can come from all different sides. If you say, okay, it's going to come from this, you're going to feel untethered. That's okay. That's part of the process. I I think I would have felt a little better with that. I was just kind of years of being frustrated of, okay, I'm not, I'm not making progress on this and then come to this. Okay. Starting to do it but it's just because I've thrown my hands up of, okay, whatever I'm doing, it just hasn't been working. So I'm in your hands. Mm -hmm. Like the pain point needed to get you over that. Like, yes, I got to do something else. Yeah. This is not working. It has, I have to be, you had to get to a really uncomfortable place to say like, I'm willing to be uncomfortable on purpose instead of uncomfortable accidentally or uncomfortable in the dark. And part of it has to do with like this perspective that the game is rigged. Like you can play the game and play the game, but the game is rigged. Like the house always wins. (laughs) So (laughs) maybe we should stop playing the game like this because it's not, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm, it's not winning or losing, but I'm not able to be authentic in this game. Yeah. Like that Karine, you, and I, you and I talked about this of after one of the sessions that it looked like it was attachment parenting in reverse, that it was the, they were safe on their own and then they would come towards you to be a little uncomfortable and then go back and then come out a bit more and go back. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, attachment parenting in reverse. And it's just, I think every, all of us have gone through that to one extent or another, those on the receiving end. So I think it's just, there's some value in exploring like what that is and uh, making it easier for people that come later. Because like you said, the people that bump up against the wall and they get frustrated, you're, you're getting a few people that have gone, have, have figured out how to get over that wall. Now are we coming back and explaining to the rest of, it doesn't have to be as hard as I did it. <laughs> or maybe it does. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. maybe. But we can normalize that in some in some way, what you're kind of describing. Like it's hard because it's hard is is like there's a value in saying something like that. Um, I would love to be able to say this is the easiest thing in the world and just come on in and it'll be all <laughs> rainbows. And it's hard because we're being anti like culture. Well, we're, we're expecting ourselves to challenge things that we've been spoon fed for a long time. And that that's going to be weird and it's going to be hard. Yeah. And it might touch a bit. You were mentioning the instant gratification challenge, uh, Gavin, it might also touch on the community challenge too. So maybe I, I kind of made a note because I feel like we could weave that in a little bit to that point too. So why don't we start with that? And 
see where we get to and and um and let's all contribute too like if anybody has something they want to add let's i think do that as we go um kareen do you want to start with the first challenge which was connecting to emotions and talk a little bit about how that actually shows up what do we mean and how is connecting to emotion a challenge when it comes to getting to know our values and then if you could go into a couple of different ways that we can address that and move through it mm -hmm. yeah i really enjoy um emotions i have been disconnected from my emotions for a very long period of my life and when I was able to reintegrate them, um, I realized how much more authentic things were. And this work actually became, I was going to say easier, but it actually became possible. Um, and so what I did was I did a lot of self-observation as I was like bringing this uh, detached part of me back in so that I could begin to describe that process and begin to to help other people that are feeling in a very relatable way why we'd want to do this why we would want to get connected to our uh, emotions and how it's connecting to getting to know an authentic part of ourselves and at the essence of it and how it connects to knowing our values is it is one of the most predictable and uh rich ways of mining when one of our values is being activated either positively or negatively. And, and when you've got this, like, it's like immediate reaction. You can't, even if you're disconnected from your emotions, like I've, I'm dead inside, you still have like euphoria or moments of joy or panic, or like, you're still having those fight and flight kind of emotions, even if you can't articulate them or uh, run the full like flowery gamut of that spectrum. You're good. Your body is going to have these emotional reactions regardless. Um, and so if you can grab that emotion, be like, okay, I've had this one, this one little emotion and I can track it back to, was this a value being satisfied? Was it uh, a happy moment or a satisfied, or I felt deeply like gratified and tracing that back, like when I feel like my value of efficiency getting satisfied and I have a moment of like, I'm not panicking. That's a very real, like I can track that back to, oh, I have a value of efficiency that I didn't know about until I tracked back my, my emotions. Um, and so some of the tangible tips that we can suggest or offer is like really developing an emotional vocabulary uh, and practice using emotional words. Like when I work with um, my child and she's in, in expressing, like you, she's definitely going down an emotional path, but she doesn't have the words for it. I will just start to, is it this, is it this, is it this, is it this? And you can do that with yourself, be your own parent. Uh, hi, Green. You seem to be like, you're pretty jammed up here. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Renee Brown has a beautiful book called Atlas of the Heart, where she goes into a lot of these like descriptions of uh, emotions. And so we can use like, literally like page one. <laughs> is it this? Um, and then some of these mindset pieces, uh, using emotions as signals instead of labeling them as annoyances or barriers or distractions. So I would say that's like some of like spot on ways that we can use emotions to track back and identify our values. And then to also, once they're identified, use them to see when in real time, as we get better and better at it. How are they showing up in everyday situations? Yeah, that's awesome, Green. The emotions piece is so big. And um, I'll just say, because we're going to be talking about community and we were just talking about community, um, we just don't see a lot of people talking about their emotions in a clear way. We purposely hide our emotion words and we say other things instead. We'll say, well, that's stupid instead of saying I'm upset because I'm upset has this extra layer of vulnerability to it, you know, holla Brene, Brene Brown. But I think 
as a collective, we're getting a bit better at being willing to use these scary words, but um, it can be helpful to notice what are the people around me saying <laughs> and, and finding someone who's willing to use emotion words can be really cool. And um, the more time we spend around them, I think the, the, the more comfortable we also feel in using those emotion words, because at first it can feel really vulnerable to, to use them just because we might feel alone. <laughs> so uh, that's the emotion piece. That's the first challenge is, uh, is, is getting to know our emotions because our emotions are a really important pathway to our values. The second one is perfectionism. Before we go into the second one, Gavin, did you want to add anything on that first one? No, I think that's a, a really good one. And uh, the what helped me is I, I told myself that I have to listen to, to my emotions, that they're there, but I don't have to listen to what they tell me to do. <laughs> Whenever I get upset, there's a reason I'm upset and that's valid and I, I own that. But what it's telling me to do, I try and set that aside. That's for thinking brain to do. And, and that's the that has helped me a lot because... When I find myself upset, I previously was trying to dismiss all of it. And I, I now I just take the side, okay, you know, I'm not going to beat someone to a pulp. I'm not capable and I don't want to spend 20 years in jail. So let's find something else. But I am upset. So let's let's talk about that. And having a conversation with myself about that, it's kind of like making myself feel seen by myself. It's uh it's a strange thing to to do that and it's kind of like oh okay i can i can i can approach this thing that was a crucial conversation and very emotionally laden in a very calm way and i can walk away and check in with myself and okay my emotional side is satisfied with the way my rational side handled that it felt seen or whatever it was just kind of like eh, that that that's not small thank you <laughs> yeah I love that you made that distinction, Gavin, between what we're feeling and then what we do about the feeling. And I think often we we conflate those two and we think anger means punching a wall or anger means yelling. And so we think, oh no, anger is bad. I can't get angry. But actually anger is happening in here. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on before... <laughs> the choice, the action to punch the wall or yell, that's really important and is a signal. And we need to be listening to that part and uh, allowing it to be there and acknowledging that it is there. There's a great book that I'll just mention before we go to the next one about um, explaining the function of different emotions. It's called uh, The Language of Emotions. I talk about this book a lot because it's the best. Carla McLaren is the author. Um, and she really goes into very clear, compassionate detail about what each emotion is offering us. And for example, anger is letting us know that a boundary has been stepped on. We need to know when our boundaries have been stepped on. So we need to be able to tap into our feelings of anger. And then this next step about what we do about it is a whole other conversation. So separating those two is so important. Thanks for mentioning that, Gavin. Any other thoughts before we go to number two? All right, perfectionism. Yeah, so perfectionism shows up a lot for probably all of us in different ways. Um, it can be sneaky to even identify because um, sometimes perfectionism shows up as not doing anything. And we think, well, no, I'm, I'm not a perfectionist. I don't have a perfectly clean house. I don't have like all the things that I thought would signal perfectionist. Um, but perfectionism can also look like starting a task and abandoning it. Because we think if I can't do this perfectly, I'm, I'm just going to leave it because I can't handle that uncomfortable feeling of um, an imperfect job done. And that can lead to stagnation in values exploration because either we quickly write up our top values and we're saying, okay, I completed that, perfect, done. And if I change it, that means I was wrong or I made a mistake 
or we tell ourselves these funny things about how changing our mind means I'm, I messed up before. Um, and it can also lead to poor self-talk. If we're constantly changing our, say, our top values, then we might be doubting ourselves and, and, and saying, oh, I, it was instead of just neutrally observing and saying it was my top value used to be acceptance. And now I'm realizing it's actually belonging instead of going, oh, how fascinating. We say, oh God, well, I got it wrong before. And am I ever going to get this right? Seriously, it's going to take my whole life to figure out each of these values. So that perfectionism mindset can be, um, can be really defeating and can make us not want to even go down this path that actually can be very nourishing. So a couple of things to, to do to practice leaving the perfectionist mindset and moving into the learning mindset. A tangible tip is to purposely take on something that you know you'll be bad at. Take on a new hobby, um, you know, put yourself in an environment you've never been in and set an intention to um, not do it well. That's not the goal of this thing I'm gonna take on is I'm gonna take on tennis. I don't even know the rules of tennis. The goal is not to be the best tennis player in town. The goal is to learn something new, for instance. And then hopefully when something comes, when you're, when you miss a shot or you forget the rule, the thing you're telling yourself isn't, God, I'm really bad at this. (laughs) The, The message is, oh, okay, I'm learning another new thing. Look at all these things I'm learning by taking on this new hobby. And that's the mindset piece is, is, we often will tell ourselves, you know, I made a mistake. And it's a real conscious practice to instead say, I learned something. A friend of mine says all the time, because she has this perfectionist tendency, hardcore. So she says all the time, practice makes better. <laughs> and I can tell she's telling herself, as, but everyone else gets to hear it too. And it helps. <laughs> it helps me um, to remember that. And the fact that we used to say practice makes perfect says how the collective has bought into this idea that we should be striving towards perfect, which is actually completely unachievable. We're setting ourselves up for failure doing that. So let's instead switch to practice makes better. Any thoughts, questions, ideas that have come up about that second one? Just because you brought it up that uh, your the skill of focusing your actions on a, a specific value is has far more applicability than just that one thing. It's the you know, why am I doing this? What am I getting out of this? What can I get out of this situation? Choosing what to focus on is uh, a very applicable skill across a lot of things. So, but uh, being able to name the thing that you want like a i value perfection okay you're you're setting yourself up for this but if you also value learning maybe you can focus a bit more on that okay that's i think that's helped me a lot because you get into a place where there's a lot of values that are in conflict and you have to what's more foundational what's more critical to me and i can acknowledge that other values are not being met here so it's a it's a big skill set. So any hints and tips on that, I'll take them. <laughs> yeah. And that, to your point, Gavin, it's, I come up against this all the time where I start to venture into one area and I'm, I'm deciding I'm going to focus on, you know, my value around perfectionism, for example, but I, I hit it and it's like, it's like um, touching one little thread on a web, you know, it's all connected. So it really takes a lot of focus to to stick to one item, one value for, or maybe it's one emotion or one thing when that's useful. And then also have the discernment to know when it's going to be worthwhile to expand the view and say, how does this connect to everything else I have going on? And maybe I'll let myself go down the rabbit hole to explore a bit. 
And maybe I'm talking that through with a friend or I'm able to talk that through with myself and understand, oh, okay. So maybe we come up with an aha moment if we're letting ourselves wander and we're able to, to realize, okay, perfectionism for me is connected to my value of belonging because everybody else that I seem to hang out with right now really values perfectionism. And ex- I feel more accepted when I am more perfect. Okay. So there's a relationship here between belonging and perfectionism that is worthwhile for me to keep an eye on. Um, so it's a windy, it's a windy road. That's for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no clear answers. That's for sure. Uh, Kareen, do you have anything you want to add to Gavin's uh, thoughts and also his like wondering about any tips? <laughs> Just keep the, just keep swimming. No, um, (laughs) I was, I was going to point out, I've got a, a value that I have been like, I've been doing this for 15 years and I also continue to evolve my values. So there's no tips and tricks other than continue to be entertained and (laughs) delighted by the, the new information that comes in and and I think that falls under my value of like curiosity and uh, non-judgment, but it's a lovely bridge over to the third one of self-trust. And I think that's a really like critical piece that we can put these two together. And of course, like Ali pointed out, these are all uh, threads on a web. Um, none of these stand alone. Um, the self-trust challenge comes in um, when we're, looking to other people uh, that seem to have life figured out or that are in authority positions to tell us what our values are. There's often like societal values or your country's values or your religious values. And we get sucked into uh, assuming that those are ours and they're a pretty good, like, okay, like if they're good values, um, you know, you can, you can ride that for a while, but I would encourage you to continuously look, are they mine? Where did they come from? How do I experience those values? Because my value of, um, work hard, like, uh, might be different from my dad's generation or how my dad experienced work hard. Um, the early bird gets the worm where I'm into a space of like, uh, yeah, work hard. Do, do well and leave space for my brain, leave space for my soul. Um, these other things for me to be a, an integral person also need space for my version of working hard, work ethic space uh, of my values. Um, I would also say this one, the self-trust one is connected for me in a big way around trauma. And especially like we can get disconnected from our self-trust if we've been in um, relationships and they don't have to be like, like seriously, like trauma every day, but where we've been in relationships with people who drive, uh, drive the car, the metaphorical car of like, this is what we do. This is what is important. And, and you aren't given permission and you don't think to give yourself permission to go and explore. How do I feel about that? Or we're in relationships with people that have, I don't want to say narcissists, like like the, the clinical definition, but people that really have themselves as the center of the universe and you are put into one of their orbits. That's really hard then to say, but I, I value this, which is different from you and you value that and you go ahead and value that, but I'm going to value this. That creates instant conflict in some really, if it's a a survival kind of relationship with a child or an a parent that could be really terrifying to be able to start code, uh, just to, to be, be able to define for oneself. This is how I experience the world. And this is what's important to me. Um, one of the tangible tips is when you have these moments of sec- uncertainty or insecurity, like asking a question, like if I knew the answer, what would it probably be? And it's like, sort of like tapping into this, like wise woman or wise man. Like if the wise man or woman was here, what would they say? If I knew the answer, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, you guys. Lola has things to say. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) She values 
things in her life as well. Um, <laughs> she values security and, and finding her voice is really important to her. Um, so yeah, tapping into that um, inner wisdom. And then the mindset piece, like coming up with some self-trust mantra for yourself. Uh, Ali, you shared this one before, like, I decide. And we, we teach in uh, the assertive communication course, um, being able to say, here's how I frame a sentence around my value. And it's not threatening somebody else's values. It's not creating defensiveness in others from the way that it's set up. Um, but I, through practice, start to learn how to say, this is what I value. And I start to trust that I can take care of myself. I can start to advocate for myself. I can start to set boundaries for myself with others. I can start to set standards with myself around my behavior. That's echoing my, my values. Uh, and then through practice and reiteration, that's when I start to uh, trust myself. I am somebody that I can depend on. Yeah, I love that one because, because it's so hard, I think, <laughs> because there's a lot in society that tries to make us doubt ourselves. There's a lot in media. There's a lot in what we hear from people that, that will almost purposely tell us, like, are you sure you're happy? Maybe if you had this sea do you would be even happier. You might want to take another look at your life because if you don't have a sea do you're not, you're not doing it right. And even if we don't care about sea dos like it's something gets into our brain after the millionth time. And we just think maybe I need to rethink things, <laughs> which is a great sentiment to have if we want to rethink our lives, but not probably because we're trying to decide whether or not we should get a sea do uh, so any thoughts or questions about the self-trust gaping black hole of, of epic challenge? Is that just me? Is it just me? It's really hard to get in a relationship with my own sense of self-trust. <laughs> I've, I've been doing a lot of thinking over the last few weeks. So yes, thank you for the opportunities here. But uh, one of the things that I got from that self-trust and back to perfectionism is there's a lot in society that likes judgment. Did you win or did you lose? Were you right or were you wrong? And you talk to so many people and that's the end of it for them. Like they want to be right or they pass judgment and that that's enough. And it's one of the things I got from the, the book Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a fascinating book because she doesn't tell you what, she, what lesson she's trying to teach you. So everyone gets different stuff out of it. But one of the lessons I kind of picked up is she is just not that judging of this has happened and sticking with it. It's kind of like, it, it's coming around again. Let's just do better next time. And that's the, that's kind of where that, that self-trust and perfectionism kind of, I, I made a bit of a breakthrough or can work, overcome that. So you don't have to get it right just this once. You can do better this time and then it's going to come again, do better then too. So, so that's kind of one of the things that I, I took on that, that I'm still learning. Yeah. I love that Gavin, that idea of, a of our, our lives being, uh, maybe this is mentioned in the book. I actually have that on my list, but I haven't read it yet. And Karina, I know you have that, that um, our lives aren't a linear path. It's a spiral. Right. And so, when we're, when we feel like, oh God, I'm back at the same place I was, <laughs> we're not, we've, we've spiraled back around, but we are, um, we're, st we're, there's movement still happening as we go. Um, and we are the next version of ourselves. The next time we encounter that tricky thing, there will always be another chance like you're talking about again. So let's go into the fourth challenge, which is community. And we can't help but talk about this one, hey, when we talk about all the others, because it's everywhere. Um, the example I really like, there is a, um, a man whose name is Dr. Chris Ryan. He wrote a couple of great books. One of them is called Sex at Dawn. He also has a great podcast called Tangentially Speaking. And in that podcast, he mentions this metaphor a lot, which is 
it is so hard. <laughs> the, one of the reasons why life is so hard is because it's like we are healthy fish swimming around in a poison river. And we do all this work on ourselves and we learn new things and we take a course or we go to a yoga class or we create our living space to be really nurturing. And then we go out into the world, the poison river, and it chips away at us. And it, whether we like it or not, it gets to us. And it, um, whether it's a lot or a little, depending on our sensitivity levels, it, you know, poisons us to a degree. And um, that's a really hard challenge to, to, to try to address and work through because, I mean, if you have a poison river and you dump a bucket of, you know, clear water in it, <laughs> you almost don't know that you did that, right? Um, and the inverse, if you have a beautiful, healthy pond and you, you dump a bucket of sewage in there, you really notice the bucket of sewage. Like it really impacts the beautiful purity of the pond. So we have this constant challenge of sort of pushing against the, the poison that's in the world or in ourselves, if it's self-talk. Um, and it's a really worthwhile effort, I think, to um, be deliberate, deliberate about what is in our community, whether it's our community of our home or our, you know, community of school or learning or living or work, and really look at what is in my community and what might be um, knowingly or unknowingly, you know, poisoning me. Um, one tangible, um, actually, we're still saying an example of this that's small for me is that I don't I love my friend group and I'm really finding belonging in that friend group also I don't like going out to clubs and stuff like that but a lot of my friends do so I have found that I keep getting sucked into going to clubs <laughs> even though I don't enjoy it because I love these people so much and so I'm number one doing a thing I don't like to do number two putting myself in an environment that kind of poisons me a bit like it's, it's like loud, overwhelming. There's like drinking everywhere. And like a, a version, an earlier version of me was super into that. So no judgment against that. But right now it's so counter to where I'm trying to go. And yet I find myself slipping up and getting sucked in and then needing to take a look and be like, okay, this belonging value <laughs> that feels so good to hang out with my friends. I need to keep that sucker in check because it's bringing me into these little pockets of community that are actually not good for me and not what I want. So a tangible tip is to share your values with your community. If you have a community that you um, are around a lot, I'm not even going to say if you like them or don't like them, because sometimes we're at work and we're not, we don't even really like <laughs> the community that we're in at work or where, wherever it is. But let the people that you're around a lot know what your values are and let them know that if this is true, you're going to be making attempts to live more in alignment with them. Give them a heads up. Number one, it's helpful because if you start to change your behavior, they'll have a sense of why. And number two, they might surprise you and help you. They might know, oh, okay, this is a cool, they might follow you a bit if they're in line with that new value you're coming up with, but they might um, want good things for you and they might um, help you on this path to um, um, cleaning up your river a little bit <laughs> so that you can stay healthier longer and maybe not right too and that's okay but um, allowing that possibility to be there can be really helpful so sharing your values with the people in your life and just seeing where it goes from there um, a mindset tip too is um, just to notice a lot of you'll notice a lot of these mindset pieces around around like uh, um, neutral observation or mindfulness. Notice how you feel when you go against the crowd. Gavin, you mentioned this a little bit earlier when you're talking about you know um, this this attachment uh, parenting in reverse. If we're getting super clear into our values, we can also start to really notice where environments or people are not in line with our values and that the 
clearer we get in ourselves, the harder it can actually be to be around um, a misalignment sometimes. Um, not if you're a, a Buddha like Kareen and you're just able to <laughs> let things flow through you and extreme non judgment and all of that. <laughs> uh, something I'm striving for, for sure. But if you're able to notice what happens when you, when I, for example, say, man, all my friends are going out to the club and I'm, I'm going to say no to going out to the club and just notice. For example, I might I might feel uh, that sense of belonging get jammed up a bit, and I might need to have a conversation with that value of belonging. And then I might also notice my self trust go up because I made a decision that I know in the long run is good for me. So really getting a sense of what happens internally when I do that really courageous thing of going against the crowd, whether I consider them my crowd or just the collective in general. And see if you can give yourself permission to withstand that momentary discomfort, because it is going to be an uncomfortable moment, the first time and probably the 500th time too. Um, withstand the comfort and then see what comes into your life once you've made a bit of room too, um, because saying no to something means you suddenly have a vacuum, there's space for something else. And often the new thing that is in alignment with our values won't come in until we've made space for it. So there's this limbo time often where we'll say no, we'll feel a certain way about it. And then there's a new birth, a new metaphorical birth of another opportunity that, that, that may show up in its place. So the community piece is really big and challenging. And there are things that we can do to address it. Thoughts or questions or comments around that community piece before we go into the fifth? Mm -hmm. I have you both and I've, I seem to have a monopoly of your time. I'm going to take it shamelessly. Yeah. Just a couple observations or things that I think I've seen anyways, back to that point about there seems to be a, a hard barrier of following the rules. You can get that far and then you have to take another, like a quantum step. You, you can't use the same rules. I, I think that there's people that live variously on that. Like there's people who are in that space and I love those pe hanging out with those people and, and seeing them do the work, but there's lots of people that are staying behind that barrier. And specifically like there's two types, there's people that think that there's something beyond that, but can't, can't do it, can't see it. And I have a couple friends that I, I see them doing stuff that they're, you know, they want some emotional validation from it, but they can't justify it or somehow. And when you see it and you can just kind of give them a little pat on the back and give them some words that say that, you know, it, it's what they're looking for, but they can't put their finger on it. They could never duplicate it again. I find that quite satisfying, even though I've tried several times to talk with those people about what's what's beyond that wall and they they just can't do it. They They actively resist it. And there's other people that really don't want you going over that wall. And you have to identify who those people are and, and what they do as well. Because it's, uh, if you're going to have to keep them in your life, you have to be able to manage that. And my mom is very much like that, I found. It's just, she she is very much played by the rules of society and what people think is a very big part of all her judgments and things. And once I told myself that, it's kind of like, yes, that's what I've been rebelling against for 40 years. And, <laughs> and that's why I, I joke at her, like a few years ago, they got a new car. They traded in their five-year-old car because they, I don't know, reasons. They said the, the dealership would give them a good deal. Well, of course they would. It's got 30,000 kilometers on it. It's had all of the service and stored inside. You've taken it to detailers. It's basically a new car. Of course, the dealership was wanting that. And they bought, you know, they traded in their 2015 Toyota Venza and got a 2019 Toyota Venza. And I'm just, what a complete lack of imagination to get the same car. <laughs> But I think that my mom pushed that because that's what people think, you know, 
if you have money, what's the point of it if you can't show people that you're doing well? And once I put my finger on that, my brain just kind of went click, click, click. Okay, this is this is toxic to me. I need to manage this appropriately, but it's not like I'm going to kick my mom out of my life. Well, I have two siblings that have done it, so I guess there's, a, <laughs> I don't want to go there. So, so that's just kind of interesting, but how you can just give people a little pat on the back in the way that they need, but don't know how to ask. I find that very rewarding. So. Yeah. Oh man, Kevin, you mentioned so many interesting things. I feel like I could go down. Kareen, is there anything you want to say? Go down all the rabbit holes. Yes. <laughs> that's, I love the rabbit holes. Um, one of the things I love that you just touched on is how and I, I'm hoping that we'll do a podcast episode specifically on this soon, which is um, part of it is you don't have to know what your values are for them to be driving your behavior. Like if you were going to ask your mom, what's important to you, mom? Like she might not be able to pinpoint the word that drives her to want to get, uh, you know, the same car, but a few years newer. But there's, you're identifying because you have this language, you're kind of guessing at things like, okay, um, like using money in a certain way or the optics of how people are uh, like um, perception around how the money is being used. And you're sort of making guesses like kind of on her behalf, which is such a fascinating example or, or exercise to do. But she never has to make any of those uh, um, decision-making mechanisms come to light for her to continually make decisions in line with that pattern. And it's so interesting because we can see in life people who are doing just fine and actually making quote unquote great decisions without ever really knowing what their values are. And then we see other people who, be, who might be making decisions that are actually harming them. And they also don't know what's driving those decisions. And I think what's so cool about realizing that that's happening happening in the world is by choosing to say i am going to figure out what my values are and how they're influencing me by choosing to go that route it might be harder in some ways but actually it ends up number one meaning i'm i get to choose what, how my life looks and how it how it works out I'm also way less confused about what's going on in my life. And then I'm able to cut out the things that aren't mine. Like Kareen says, if I'm, if I'm constantly making the same decision over and over again, because of a value that's there, but it's not mine. I borrowed it from society or from a friend or from family. It's a funny thing. As soon as we realize that and we lift it up and we give it a name and we realize, oh, you actually don't belong to me. That's what starts the pathway to doing it a different way. If we never name it and we never know it's there, it's really, really hard to do things a different way. And so we almost put ourselves at risk when we don't get to know our values and we just hope. Hopefully, my values are so pure and clean and clearly mine that I will live the life I want and I won't be burdened by these values that aren't mine or these values are going to that are going to accidentally harm me um and so sometimes I'll see people in the world and I'm just like wow they are living so clearly in line with their values and they have no idea <laughs> they don't need to know to move forward and then sometimes I see you know uh, we, we probably see this more, right? Being in the line of work that we're in Korean, where we see how much someone would benefit from getting to know what their values are and how much happier and more meaningful they would feel their lives are if they got to do that. So yeah, I love that example, Gavin. And I love that you're taking, you're, you're really looking at your own stuff and you're simultaneously letting yourself play with these exercises of what other people are doing too, because it is really fascinating. Did you want to add anything else, Gavin? Uh, I, I think that you've got a, a great analogy 
talking about the values of society and people living them. I think there's a lot of people that live them on autopilot and, and they, they get their emotional needs filled just fine. Just they haven't had to think about it. And, and that's a great percentage of the population. There's also another percentage of the population that gets most of their needs satisfied living on autopilot, but it's not the cost benefit of doing the work to, to get over that wall to take that next step, but it's a little unsatisfying. And then there's people like, I'm sure the people, myself and all the other people you've come across with in VBL, which is, we can't handle it anymore, okay? There's gotta be something different. <laughs> Totally. This is just so uncomfortable. I I need something different. Yeah, absolutely. I love to meet those people. I know. <laughs> That's our people. <laughs> and to that point that uh, we get to choose as well our network. There's some relationships and networks that, uh, like you pointed out, like family and, and work folks, but we also have rich lives outside of family and work too, to be able to choose um, which people do I spend my life with um, that is in alignment with my values. And we gravitate naturally to them. We sort of find them where they're like going off about a thing. We're like, oh no, not you. <laughs> right. And it's not necessarily like, oh, you're out of alignment with my values. It's just like, I'm shutting down. I'm having an emotional nope response. I'm going to go find other people that open my heart or make me feel happy and, and let me feel comfortable with myself. Um, but whether we're aware of it or not, and I would hope in this VBL world that we're consciously choosing and being able to self declare, these are my values. And, and we have sentences now because we've taken the, the workshops that teach us how to find the language to articulate our values in a safe way and that we're starting to have people self-select or we're selecting to spend time with people that are in alignment we probably will never be exactly in alignment with all of our values but the ones that matter in my friendships those are the ones that I need to get um, openly met and I will keep searching if I can to find new communities and I think with our online communities, uh, you know, we can find Facebook communities. We can find, um, like, it, I'm thinking, like, I grew up in a small town. And, you know, you kind of, like, you grew up with who you grew up with. But we don't have that as much anymore. We can expand beyond that and find our communities of people that are um, vibing on the same vibe as us, which is, man, we're so lucky. We're so, so lucky. Um. Let's switch into our num numero five, uh, <laughs> instant gratification. I really wanted you to say numero five -o. I was just waiting for you to somehow figure Cinco. out what five is in Spanish <laughs> or go with five-o. Oh, what green stop? <laughs> I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> uh, so uh, Please continue. Number five, instant gratification. And, and that's really looking at this like one and done cultural um, encouragement of uh, being disconnected, being dead to ourselves, going on autopilot. Um, this uh, so many things require so much regimen um, to just survive, to get the money that we need, to pay the bills, to get the, the place that we uh, want to live to get the clothes that we want to have to show the people that we're driving the cars that we're supposed to drive. Um, and we're taught there's an absolute consumerism, like encouragement of instant gratification and values work is slow hitting that wall and re re aligning our choices is slow. It's slow work and it's not easy. Um, and these distractions that are constantly inundating us can be really intoxicating and can really take us off track. Um, and one of those, like the tips of like, we cutting out a habit that is a distraction, for example, like scrolling social media, when you wake up in the morning, being able to 
realign that with, does this fit? Like you can just ask them the question, does this fit with my values? Is this who I want to be? Is this the kind of person that um, lives my values? Am, am I the person that lives my values when I do this? And then choosing something different, making a new decision and creating a new habit that can replace that one that is more in alignment. But even that thought process of, is this what I want to do? Uh, is a disrupting thought that we don't always have. And a lot of these values-based living questions are disruptors culturally, intellectually, emotionally, and trying to break apart and then re reintegrate with something more in alignment. These are all disruptor pieces. And, and this instant gratification is one that just goes on autopilot that you have to purposely disrupt. Um, with values-based inquiry to say, is this who I want to be? And the the way to get um, moved past this one is to just knock yourself off track. It's fine. Like you'll come back, you'll find new things to do first thing in the morning. <laughs> it's not like you'll just sit in bed staring at the floor unless you want to choose that, right? You're going to, you saying, I don't want to do this first thing in the morning. This is a thing that is more in alignment and just keep trying out new things until you find like, ah, this is my one. I, um, quietly move through downstairs and I drink my coffee in silence or I put on early morning jazz cafe music in the background. I, uh, talk to creator first thing in the morning, um, while I sip my coffee at like find those things that really jam with who you want to be until you're that person, like until you're actually living that life. Cause it takes a minute for habits to reform. And this isn't, I would never say this is about fake it till you make it. That's, that doesn't, that's not what we're talking about. It sounds a lot the same, but this is not about faking it. It's about trying on new things that are purposely chosen. Is, is it this? and trying it and then assessing and then accepting and then integrating. Like it's, it's more than just like, oh, this is who I am. And I'm going to do it a hundred times until it's a habit. There's something artificial about that. And that is not what values-based living is about. It's, it's about trying on new things until it feels like we, we do the assessment of authenticity. Mm, I got it. This is the one. How about you guys? What do you think? Yeah, I love, I love this one because I do get sucked into instant gratification. That blast of oxytocin and serotonin that we get when we succumb to all of the different ways that that's so available nowadays is really like, I just find that, especially when I've done it a million times, I find that really enticing. And so um, for me, it's, it's about replacing an instant gratification habit that I know is not, is not helping me with something that is incrementally less harmful <laughs> or incrementally more helpful. So I'm not necessarily going to replace, for example, scrolling on Instagram in the morning for an hour with going for a run for an hour because I'm replacing something I enjoy with something I hate. And that's probably not going to stick. So instead what if I was really gentle and allowed myself to take my time? And I said, instead of scrolling on Instagram, when I wake up, maybe I'm going to pick something that I actually really like. So I'm going to leave productivity off the table and just say, it's not about getting something done. It's about switching my patterning right now. So maybe I'm going to have a bath. Maybe I'm going to go for a walk. Maybe I'm going to read a book for an hour. Whatever I feel like doing that morning, if I have an hour to scroll, I have an hour to do this other thing that I may be telling myself is, oh, I never, I, self-care is really important, but I just don't seem to have the time. Well, give myself the time. Give myself permission to um, not swing from the pendulum of one extreme to the other, but find that sweet middle spot where I'm still getting that slow uh, sort of like seeping in of oxytocin and serotonin, um, but I'm not being blasted with it so that I become addicted. 
I'm starting my day in a way that's, that is aligned with my values. And it's also enjoyable and sustainable for me. Gavin, did you want to add anything to that? I have one other one that I actually, that keeps coming up that sort of threads in all of these pieces. And I think we talked about it a little bit, but I'll, I'll let you, let you respond to that one first. So you're saying stumble till you find it. Don't fake it till you make it, right? I like it. That's the quote of the day. <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, I feel like we need to get like bumper stickers made. Now. Yeah. <laughs> That's going yeah. in our merch. <laughs> oh, I love it. The one thing I was going to just add that's part of this, and, and Ali touched on it earlier, is one of the challenges that we have in doing this work is that values are unconscious motivators and they want to stay unconscious. And we are consciously trying to open this black box that has like, what are those things called Gavin, where there's like a, a door that's on a hinge that wants to snap shut. You know what I mean? Like a screen door anyway, like that wants to just snap shut. Oh, like bat wing doors, like to the things going into the old time taverns in the West. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. But the doors want to keep like sh slamming shut, even though we're trying to like peek them open. And sometimes they're so slippery that we have the words of our values. And then in the next sentence, we blink. And, and we've been talking like when we, when we do coaching with our clients, we can see it happen. It's happened to me where I'm like, yeah, that's my value. And, and it showed up in this situation like this. And then in the, I take a breath and in this next second, I'm like, what was that? What did I just say? It was good. It was meaningful. I, I can't remember. And it's not like, just because I'm getting older, <laughs> whatever it's, it's genuinely, these are slippery threads that want to go under the water, under, under the surface. And we, the only way we can bring them into consciousness and keep them there is through repetition is through practice. Um, like, again, I've been doing this for 14 years. I always have them, my values listed on a sticky note in my phone and on my computer screen because when I'm in an elevated uh, emotional state, they're extra slippery, extra hard to find. And so I'm like, I am having a, like one of my values is getting really disrupted and I can't think about any of them, any of them. And I need to have either someone coach me through it. Like I'll reach out to Allie and say, I'm having this thing. And then she'll say things like, is it this? Is it this? <laughs> right? Like, start to coach us through it, like, and, and bring us back to a reminding state of, you know, what your values are. Just give yourself a minute. Like, let's not forget that this is unconscious shadow work and it's hard because it wants to be unconscious. Love that, which is why we have an entire course on exploring your shadow values and help people go into the depths and have techniques to go there when they want to go there and then be able to get out <laughs> um, and, and, and get out safely and get out safely. Yeah, exactly. Love that. Great addition. Green. Mm. Any other thoughts or musings or comments before we do a little wrap up today? Oh, that was fun. Mm. It was super, super valuable to hear your thoughts, Gavin. Thanks for being willing to do that. I really appreciate that. Um, and so that's it. Thanks for joining. Um, we're like This is recorded, so you'll be able to find it later on our socials. We do have a podcast for those who are watching the recording. We do have a podcast called Values Based Living, where this will probably be posted. That'll probably be one of the places this is posted. And we'll put links to all of the things we mentioned, the different books and references. We'll put links to that. We'll also put links to the courses. For example, the Know Your Values course is sort of like the starting point. It's the, it's the foundational workshop that's a prereq for all the other workshops because it helps you get to know not just what you think your values might be, but it gives you a really good starting point of, okay, where today in this place I'm at in this moment what are my top say five values 
and we um, give some ways to figure that out. And also we start playing a little bit with what does it mean that these are my top values and um, how are they showing up in my life and how are they helping or harming um, and, uh, and kind of get the juices flowing so that the other courses you can just slide right in and use what you learned in course one for all the other courses. <laughs> okay, well then let's wrap up. Thank you so much for joining. And um, yeah, this makes me feel very and very inspired. So thanks for being here. And until next Thank time. You. All right. Take care. Guys. Thanks everyone. Have a really great rest of your day. All right. Bye for now. Thank you both. Thank you.